absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. Levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication. There was one well done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight. So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you closer to the threshold. What do you think the timeline of the cure is in that, in that perspective? Oh you know, I, I used to vigorously say, I don't know that we can come up with a cure. I now say I do think it's foreseeable. As far as timeline, it depends on how lucky we are and how simple it is. So if, if we are correct that there are a thousand different types of Crohn's disease, we probably can cure certain types that are, have a relatively easy intervention pretty quickly, say Early in, onset, fi in very five severe years, IBD in five where you years. get a bone marrow transplant. You know, yeah, so a, 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 a bone marrow derived problem could be cured by a bone marrow transplant, although that by itself has its issues. However, other things that are more complex, that may be epithelial oriented, that won't respond, respond to a bone marrow transplant and don't have a quick fix are gonna be much more difficult. So I bet probably a cure for a partial subset is going to be fairly rapid, maybe, maybe five years, probably a decade. But it's like cancer. Right now, we talk about long-term remission rates being 90% in some types of tumors and dismal in others. But I, I think that most people... Had pedosplenic <coughs> T-cell lymphoma being Most example. people would... would um, I, I shouldn't say most people, many people might argue what we really want is make sure quality of life is well controlled with, a, with drugs that are incredibly effective right. and, and not costly. Right. And if we can achieve that um, and, right. and had life, I mean, had achieved that in the next 10 years, then we would have uh, come up with an incredible success. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm, not, dedic I'm not saying that the only uh, only, only step forward is a cure by any stretch of the imagination. I absolutely agree with you that if we could get a sustained remission, then without a cure, you stop the medicine that comes back, then that's a huge step forward in a predictable fashion, and you get it right the first time, to use the parlance of, of last night. So you, 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 you quickly come up with a treatment that works and has a high likelihood of being effective and a low likelihood of having toxicity. That is a huge step forward. So the question for the audience, for, 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 not, not for the audience, but for, for the, the experts up here, is how do we get to that approach? So is the CCFA adopting the correct uh, pathway to get there? And we're starting with the PEDS risk assessment and Dermot has, you know, a, a way of getting there as well. Well, no, I think it's... It, it goes, How do we get there? It goes back to what you said last night. It's all very well identifying the genes, and we, um, but we should not be resting on the laurels of finding genes because until we fully understand what it is that the genes are telling us about the disease, that we're going to make this progress. So I think a vital step forward... Uh, the next step forward is taking these genes and doing the functional studies that we desperately need to work out why these genes lead to an increased risk in disease. We understand that. We're a significant step closer to identifying these new therapies, which then we can bring back to those patients who have those right. genetic defects. And so of an course, editorial comment the... is this is the next initiative that the CCFA is putting mm close to a million dollars to get jump-started, but we need sustained funding to pull it off. Right, but How the genes interact with other genes, genes in the environment, and genes with, with the microbe. 
and I think the most important role when you ask what the CCFA can do is picking the right topics, but also bringing these silos to continue that analogy together. That yep. the, the fact that you know the Clinical Research Alliance, the multiple collaborations, the fact that we're freely sharing information back and forth now is such a huge advance in what we're doing that isn't seen in other disease states as well that I think the CCFA has brought together. That it, it, what we need to do, the answer <coughs> for cure or for personalized medicine isn't in either of any of our labs individually. They're us getting together and sharing genetics, microbiome, what we know about Wiscott Aldrich syndrome in kids, and putting it together in, in, in intelligent ways so that we can think collaboratively about these answers, not individually. And I think that that's been a huge step forward in the last couple of years. And, and I think with the initiatives that we have, are only going to keep going. But, and then I think the other part of it that you're in, involved in is um, you know, the healthcare delivery quality improvement part of it. Once the discoveries are made and once they're clear that they should be spread, how do you do that? It has to be more than just articles and papers. That's not really how doctors change their behavior for the most part. And that's the translating discovery to therapy and practice. Right. You, you know what really heartens me about like the five years from now is that um, there are a lot of drugs which have been studied and approved for use for one reason or another. With works like in the genetic uh, studies that are coming ahead, we're going to have all this genetic complexity which will telescope down into five or ten pathways that are the critical ones and you have pathway A or pathway B. It should be possible, at least in some of these cases, to look at pathway A and say, there is a drug that's already approved for another reason that targets that pathway. So we just pull that thing out, out of the medicine cabinet and give it to our patients. Yeah, I, I, and can I just, before that, can I just uh, build on that? Thank you. <laughs> I, yes, because we, we have seen in the last couple of years, we've seen a number of studies of promising agents which have been negative. Uh, in terms of there hasn't been a, a beneficial effect. And one of my concerns about those studies is uh, we're still dealing with Crohn's disease as a whole. And these are, these are genes, uh, sorry, drugs that are attacking these particular pathways. And if we're smarter about the way we do clinical trials, that will lead to more of these drugs coming on uh, board quicker and, and for less cost. As, as, one, as one example, I, I mentioned earlier that the clinical trials, and everyone was pretty disappointed about this with IL-10 not really working, this immuno, this uh, um, hormone that quiets down the immune system. And now we know, you know that there, there are cases where IL-10 or IL-10 receptor signaling is affected. It might be now to take out of the closet those medicines and to, or the IL-10 again and use there. And, and similarly, where others have used GMCSF, which has been used in, in leukemia and pa patients are neutropenic or GCSF in patients who've been neutropenic for a long time, that failed in, in Crohn's disease in the it did very well in, in, in the phase one trial and early phase two, but failed later. And it may be that now going back to the genetics and taking that back out in pa patients that clearly have deficiencies in pathways that affect the innate immune system, yep. that those are specifically, uh, um, that we can take those back out again. But, but that'll require um, partnership with pharmaceutical companies. And is there a role for CCFA, and this has probably already been discussed in the internal medicine world, um, for NIH and CCFA to study biospecimens from clinical trials, you know, beyond CRP. Yeah, I, I have to say that I, I've been trying to persuade pharmaceutical industry to do that for a number of years, and I, I think know. they're coming round to that idea because I think they're now beginning to realize that if they can develop a biomarker of some sort which suggests that their drug is particularly useful in, in a subset population of people with IBD, that uh, that will give them uh, an advantage in the market, an advantage with the FDA. So I think, I think they're coming around to that idea. It's taken some time. Right. But, well, uh, well, we need to change the culture because everyone at this table has argued vehemently to drug companies, you have to genotype uh, prospectively and then look at responders and non-responders as a predictor. And I would add serologic and, and T cell responses, mucosal biopsies, uh, et cetera, and, and bacteria. But the drug companies to date would like the holy grail that would treat everybody. Well, we, we don't have a drug that treats not every, that in cancer, every cancer. Not 
absolutely and not. And it's naive. But with, so with, I was just going to reflect for a moment that you know I feel like we're talking about that we're on the cusp of the next big thing, but I think we're really right in the middle of it. I mean, from you know 1971 or so when people were first using 6MP, right? When Dan President, our friend and colleague in New York, taught us how to use 6 mercaptopurine to 2000, we had zero new drugs. In the past decade, we have four new drugs. We are doing personalized medicine. We're checking genetic tests and, and learning how to dose 6 mercaptopurine and azathioprine. I mean, we've, we've come an incredibly long way in, in a, sh a fairly short period of time. And with all the groundwork and, uh, and uh, that you're laying down now with microbiome and genetics, I mean, we're just about to take a huge leap forward and spring forward. But I, I feel like we get caught up in, oh, we have so much to learn, and we do. But we've really come an incredibly long way in a fairly short period of time in, in new drug development and learning about why these drugs may be working. I, th I think um, that's absolutely correct. And also, uh, the, the fact that there are more than 100 drugs in the pipeline, that's yeah. absolutely <clears throat> correct. But, um, but of course, everyone here in the room knows that you know, they have their, 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 their sibling, their patient, their friend who has disease right now. And we're, we are all as anxious as everyone here in the room to, to really get those um, out.